this morning. Uh, someone asked me about uh, last week we did the we were talking about the Lord's table and everything, and I said some about sending an email out. I have not done that yet, so you didn't miss anything. If I do not have your email address, please write it down on a piece of paper and give it to me. Don't just hand me your email name. Give me your name, too, okay? <laughs> and uh, that way I can get it, and we'll get you in. And uh, that email will be coming just so that we can have a kind of a consensus on what we'd like to do, okay? And I'll explain that in there. All right. Acts chapter number one, if you will. I'll uh, keep, try to keep up on the overhead to keep everybody where we're at with the references. But uh, Acts chapter 1, verse number 3, let's just read the verse here. Uh, to, uh, verse 1, The former treatise have I made, O Theopolis, of all that Jesus began both to do and to teach, until the day in which he was taken up. After that he, through the Holy Ghost, hath given commandments unto the apostles whom he had chosen, to whom also he showed himself alive after his passions by many infallible proofs, being seen of them forty days and speaking of things pertaining to the kingdom of God. That is Luke, writing as he begins to introduce the, the book of Acts to us. And as we begin to, I, I want to look at with you, uh, come over to Philippians chapter 3 while I'm talking. You can get the next passage. And what I want to do with you the next uh, several weeks, if you will, is look at that issue of many infallible proofs. And we're just going to enter, kind of introduce it this morning to you. And then we're going to spend some time over the next weeks talking about the issue of the resurrection. It is the Easter season. It's the season, spring's here, everybody's, you know, excited and wow, all this. And I just sit there and go, yeah, okay. <laughs> Tomorrow, today it's 70, tomorrow will be 110. So just deal with it, okay? You know, and it'll be what it is. And some get excited and you're, okay, whatever, it's your thing. Others are dreading it and I'm with you, I feel your pain, Okay. I've been here 25 years, almost 26 years now, and I, I enjoy the heat, but after about the 30th day of over 110, it's done. Time out. <laughs> time, to, time, time to take a break. But uh, as we begin to talk about the, the season, and Easter's late this year. It's later in April. It's not early. And I just thought we're coming out of studying about the Lord's table and our fellowship around and who we are in Christ and so forth. And I just, and we've been studying this in John 20, and then I'll be honest with you, Wednesday night, there's only a handful of us here in the room. And we study some stuff on Wednesday night that's fantastic, fabulous, supercalifragilistic, expiatidocious, and you got to know about this stuff. And then I go, man, we're going to teach this on Sunday because I get more of you, okay? So we're going to go through some of the things that we've been studying in John, but we're going to do it with Luke as well, just talking about these many infallible proofs. Look at Philippians 3, and verse, we'll start reading in verse 7. The, the, where I'm after is in verse 10, but look at verse 7. But what things were gained to me, those I counted lost for Christ. The, the list there in verse 4, 5, and 6 about the flesh and his religious activity, the Apostle Paul says. Yea, doubtless, and I count all things but loss for the excellency of the knowledge of Christ Jesus my Lord. Note, think about the word knowledge, Philippians 3, 7. Okay? Think about knowledge. For whom I have suffered the loss of all things and do count them but dung that I may win Christ and be found in him, not having my own righteousness, which is of the law, but that which is through the faith of Christ, the righteousness which is of God by faith, that I may, look at that word, know him, know, knowledge, the knowledge of Christ Jesus our Lord, and the power of his resurrection, and the fellowship of his sufferings being made conformable unto his death, if by any means I might attain unto the resurrection of the dead. But the reason I want to look at all of that is look at what Paul says in, three, in verse number 10. I want to know him, the knowledge of Christ Jesus, our Savior, and I want to know the power of his resurrection. You and I, as members of the church, the body of Christ, we need to know more about our Savior than anyone else does. We need to be able to look and, and, and be able to have a conversation at this time of year. We celebrate the resurrection every day, right? I say that, we all say amen. But can you explain it to me? Can you talk to me about it? 
Can you have a conversation with someone that begins to say, hey, this is what is really going on at Easter time? I understand the commercialism. I got that. I understand all the pagan, you know, yada, yada, yada. whoop de doo But can you talk about it? Can you look at what's going on and look and be able to understand, and, and by the way, answer the question of all questions. What is the message of that empty tomb? That's the question. And I just want to spend some time with you. Because our whole faith is based upon this statement. That Jesus Christ did die. He was buried. He did rise again. And he did ascend into the third heaven. Our faith is based, but can, can you talk about it? On the overhead, in our morning present, our, our welcoming screens, uh, there's a statement on there about ev- evangelistic outreach. I hope you read that. I don't put that stuff up just to make pretties go by on the screen. It says, you have a successful evangelistic outreach when you simply give the gospel, not looking for a convert. You plant, Okay? Somebody else may come by and water on that little seed you planted. But God's the one that gives the increase. Not you. What happens when you try to do it is then it becomes about you and the energy of you and your flesh. And now you got gimmicks on how to show and do this and do that. And now you got your little penny and you got your little mite and you got all this gimmickry rather than just simply looking at people and saying, look, Christ died for your sins. He was buried and he rose again the third day. And that issue of being able to understand and and how to think about that. The basis of all that we do, the basis of everything that God the Father has done is based upon the resurrection of His Son. Come over to Romans chapter number 1. Romans chapter number 1. It's very fast, it's very interesting, it's very critical to begin to just kind of understand the many infallible proofs, the statements by the Lord about himself. (laughs) He says, before Abraham was, I am. Now, no other religious leader known to man has ever said that. You know that? He makes a lot of claims about himself and who he is and what he's going to do and this and that. And so there was a great comment made one time many years ago. He's either a liar, a lunatic, or he's Lord. And what proves that he is Lord is the resurrection, is the empty tomb. So when, you, when we begin to talk about the resurrection and we begin to think about the many infallible proofs, chapter 1 of Romans, in verse number 3, just jumping in, Concerning his son, Jesus Christ, our Lord, which was made of the seed of David, according to the flesh, and declared to be. Isn't that interesting? God the Father declares him to be the Son of God with power, according to the Spirit of holiness, by the resurrection of the dead. The resurrection of the dead, the fact that he He's not here. He's risen. Is the fundamental, the foundation to God the Father declaring him to be the Son of God. That's fantastic. The Father looks at the Son and over there in John, he says, it's my life. I lay it down, I take it up. No man takes it, but I do with it what I want to do with it. <laughs> and he says, you know who I got that from? This is the RJ version. You understand that, okay? I got that from the Father. He made me that promise. Boy, to say that. Because the very basis of everything that we say, the very basis of everything that we do, of study, is based upon the fact that we're going to make a statement that Christ, Jesus, the Lord Jesus Christ, He died, He was buried, and He rose again the third day, and then He ascended into the third heaven. No other religion in the world makes that statement. They all pick that statement apart, by the way. 
You got different theories out there about it. You got a, this thing that's called the swoon doctrine. Ooh, swoon. And that is, is that in the middle of the crucifixion, the, the disciples of the Lord kept everybody away, and they switched the bodies. And it really wasn't him, it was somebody else. That's not the swoon, that's the other one. The swoon is, is that he passes out underneath all of the intensity. And then when he hits the cool air of the tomb, he revives. Really? Not when you look at the evidence, he doesn't do that. You go into the evidence, and you begin to look at the physical evidence, and the next thing you know, you know what? He didn't come out hopping like Lazarus. He just came out of the grave clothes. Leave him lay. Peter and John go. They look in there. They, they, John, John, bless his heart, he stoops in and looks in. John, or Peter just blows by him and goes in. <laughs> Blow, and, and they see the grave clothes lay. The napkin for the, over the covers of the head is laid, folded up. Just laying there. The Lord takes the, this is a Chevy truck. Sorry, guys. This word. <laughs> Chevy came to church today. Yeah. And he folds it up and he lays it there. The grave clothes are laid out. He just got up. The ladies come, Mary Magdalene, the ladies come, they look in, the angels appear to them. One standing at the head and the other at the foot. A great picture of the pictures and the typology in the Old Testament. And you know what? We're going to go look at them. Because everything he did, everything that was happening and doing and moving in these events was all in fulfillment of the typology in the Old Testament. He fulfills completely Passover, unleavened bread, first fruits. They're done. They are never to be fulfilled again, by the way. They'll be continually practiced because that's the Jews' religion, but in fulfillment, they are done. Pentecost, Acts 2, the day of Pentecost has fully come. It'll never be fulfilled again. It is done, but they'll keep practicing it till he comes. So four of the seven feast, feast events calendar of Israel is fulfilled in the Lord Jesus Christ. Three of them, sorry, the there's only three left. Trumpets, Day of Atonement, or Day of Atonement, Trumpets, and Tabernacles. That's all second coming. But look at all of that. See it. Lay it out for you. The infallible proofs. Come over to Philippians chapter 2. Philippians chapter 2. I said a couple in our last seminar that we're a people of the book. He says in Hebrews 10, Lo, I come in the volume of the book, it is written of me. <laughs> He's the center of that book. Folks, we ought to know more about him than anything else we know. What did Paul cry? I want to know him, what? More and more and deeper. And I want to know the power of his resurrection. Look at Philippians 2. Let these verses just kind of sink in this morning in your thinking. And just kind of think about it. I know doctrinally we dissect them and jump down through them, but just feel the flow, if you will. As the kids say, just feel me, you know. Little boy gets on the bus the other day. How you doing? Oh, man, just feel me, bro. Just feel me, bro. He's all cool. He, little, little kid, you know. Uh, he's got, uh, what does he have? Anyway, it doesn't matter what he has. He's, just, he's on my special ed bus, so he's just getting on and, He's got his little shades on, and he says, just feel me, bus driver. I'm like, I feel you, man. Just, just sit down and be quiet and buckle in, you know. But just feel the flow here. Philippians 2, verse 5, let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, who being in the form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation and took upon him the form of a servant and was made in the likeness of men. And being found fashion, and in fashion as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. Boy, look, just feel his thinking for you. He's God. And what did he do? He came and walked amongst men. He became human. He's the God man, the, that 100% deity, yet 100% humanity. But what did he take on? He became obedient. I love that. 
Corinthians, he says, though he were rich for your sakes, he became poor so that you could be rich. Wow, look at, look, he's the original grace thinker. He's the original guy to think back, back up there at verse number three. Let nothing be done through strife or vainglory. Boy, we're his enemies. We're not his friends. He says, I come to die for my friends in, John, in the Gospels. We weren't his friends. We were his enemies, and yet he still died for us, didn't he? Finish that verse. But in lowliness of mind, let each esteem other better than themselves. Oh, man, let that sink in. What did he? Here he is. He's God, and he comes down, but he's doing it according to the plan and the purpose of the Father. He's, there's a job to do. There's a will to be done. Now watch verse 9. Wherefore, because he did what was asked of him to do, in verse 6, 7, 8, to come and, 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 join hum and, and be the last Adam and join into humanity and then go and die and become obedient to the death, the death of the cross, and then to die for humanity, provide the answer for humanity's sin and their problems. He says, wherefore, God, there's the Father, also hath highly exalted him and given him a name which is above every name. Wow. Because he came and willingly did what was asked of him, not of necessity, that kinsman redeemer issue, willingly comes and does, and, and does, and does. In the garden, he looks over and he says, Not my will, but thy will be done. Okay? He looks over and he says, Father, if this cup could go by, let it happen. And then what happens is, is he gets over there and he says, You know, I could, my father could come and give us 12,000 legions, you know, 12,000 angels, but it's not angels. It's, it is angels, but it's legions. Okay? And then the verse says, Yeah, but who would fulfill the scripture if that was needed, if that was to happen? Okay? Verse 10 That at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow of things in heaven and things in earth and things under the earth, and that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Notice verse 10 very carefully. That at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow of things in heaven. Who's in heaven? Body of Christ, there we are. Who's in the earth? Israel, the Gentiles. Who's under the earth? There's hell, the lake of fire. And what's going to happen one day? Greg, close those doors, please. There you go. What's going to happen one day? Everybody, saved and unsaved, is going to do what? Bow. Why? What did he do? He became obedient to the death of the cross, didn't he? He went and did the will of the Father to die for the sins of humanity so, and then to be resurrected. And he did it willingly. And he does it all across the board. You're in Philippians. Uh, look back at Ephesians 1, just real quick. Ephesians 1. When he did that, the Father then is going to exalt him and glorify him. Ephesians 1, if you look down at verse 19 and 20, and what is the exceeding greatness of his power to usward who believe? according to the working of his mighty power, which he wrought in Christ when he raised him from the dead. You want to see the power of God the Father? Look at the resurrection. And set him at his own right hand in heavenly places. <laughs> you want to see the, the Father, the power, the Father's power and what he's going to do? You just go to Calvary and see 
what he's gonna, what's going to be accomplished at Calvary. So as we begin to look at the many infallible proofs, we'll get there. <laughs> and we look at the events around the cross. Seven times he speaks from the cross. We've looked at those in the past studies. We'll look at them again briefly. He does things, and when he speaks, he comes out of the three hours of darkness. He comes out of the great battle there with contending with, 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 with Satan in those three hours of spiritual darkness that are happening. He's been beaten. He's been bloodied. He's naked. They've been gambling away his clothes. And he sits there. He comes out of that. His head's erect. He never bows his head till he gives up the ghost. And he looks up there and he says, hang on a minute, there's a verse in Psalms that needs to be fulfilled. So he says, I thirst. And the guys go running, the passage says, running. And they get the little thing of vinegar, and they come up and they give it to him so that he could fulfill the Scripture. He just says things like that to move them. It just happened to be that the little jug of vinegar was sitting down there. It just happened to be there, you know. And, and it's a marvelous description when... When the guy says he, he, that, the, that the soldier ran to do it, he didn't just go, hey, we'll get over there when we get there. He, boom, he was there quickly. When he gives up the ghost, the soldiers are standing there. They've been watching him. There's two, guys, two soldiers. They've been watching him close. He gives up the ghost. They make the report back that he's dead. Pilate and the elders and the leaders of Israel go, "Uh uh-uh, man, that was way too quick. Go break his leg. So they go over and they break the legs of the two, but they come to him, they check his pulse, and he's already dead. Actually, the way the passage reads, it says that he was already dead. (laughs) How it says it. But the soldier reaches up with his spear and he pierces his side. Now, if you're alive and you cut yourself on a vein, what's coming out of you? Blood, but how is it coming? Squirt, squirt, with the pump. It says that it poured out of him. He's already dead. The water and the blood. He, they reached in, and when they pierced up, they pierced that sack around the heart from the stress of everything that was going on, and it just, boom, let it all out. He was already dead. Now, that's the Roman soldiers. Do you think the Roman soldiers know what death looks like? They invented death and torture. They go, they come to Pilate, and they, Pilate, they say, Pilate, he's dead. We've checked him. The morgue, the, the uh, mortuary has come up. The, uh, what's the guy that, the medical exam, the coroner, the medical examiner, they've come. They've declared him dead. Pilate goes, how could that be? It's too fast. Crucifixion was designed to take a long time and prolong it and make it torturous. And, and, they, and, and the centurion, he says, oh, it's true that this was the Son of God. He's dead. Great testimony there. He's got a death certificate now. The Jews were like, fine, just get him down there. Then Joseph of Mar- Ar- 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 Mar- um, Arimathea comes with Nicodemus and the other, and they take the body, and they don't go far. They go into a tomb that no man has ever laid, virgin ground, and they lay him down. They wrap his body. The chief leaders, they remember what he said, three days I'm going to rise again. So they say, hey, let's put a big stone in front of that bad boy and let's seal that thing and you put guards there because we're not going to let those disciples of his take his body and get away with something cheap here. Earthquake happened. Stone is rolled away. Soldiers are laid out. The ladies come, Mary Magdalene leading the, leading the charge. 
There's 14 appearances by the Lord after his resurrection. We'll give them to you. First one's Mary Magdalene. She shows up, looks in there. What, what have you done with him? Where'd you take him? He's not here. She runs and gets Peter and John, and they come running back, and they look in, and they begin to see the evidence. And you know what they see? The physical evidence of the grave clothes laid there. By the way, all of this is fulfillment of Old Testament typology and pictures. All through the Old Testament. We'll lay them out for you. I'm trying to entice you to come back. See what I'm trying to do here? Okay? Part two. All right? It's a trick underneath, you know, I got a trick up my sleeve here. They, they go in and John stoops. He's a little cautious. Peter's, Peter's nature is just full bore head, bull in China shop. We'll figure it out later. And boom, he goes in. And you know what they find? They find the grave clothes as they were laid. And him just come out. That napkin rolled up, set up by itself. You know what that indicates? Nothing was done in a hurry. When Lazarus, when the Lord called Lazarus forward, you know how Lazarus came out? Hopping. He's, and, he, and the Lord says, cut him loose. And they had to get over there and cut him. They didn't cut the Lord's grave clothes. He just came out of them. Not in any in in hurry. Deliberate. It's fantastic. Great testimony. Then he comes up, the stones rolled around, then the angels appear to the ladies, and all, and all that, the, the other appearances happen. And then finally he is seen, 1 Corinthians 15, we're going to get over there. Paul says he was seen above 500, seen of the 12, and Peter, and Cephas. And last of all, he was seen of me. Now, you think about who Saul of Tarsus was to the Lord. He was an enemy. All of the appearances, the physical evidence, the laws of authenticity in a courtroom, he's not here, he's risen. Paul comes along and says, yeah, his friends said he was. People who kind of were acquainted with him said he was. And me, his enemy, says he was. On the road to Damascus, when the Lord shows up to Paul in Acts 9, and he says, Who art thou, Lord? You know he's not wanting Jesus of Nazareth to be said. But that's who it was. So Paul then confirms he's what? He's risen. So you got to know all, all of that is wonderful. You need to know that. We'll view the physical evidence. We'll look at the eyewitness accounts that are going to corroborate the physical evidence. Each of the 14 appearances that show up, the specific groups, very critical, very key. But before we can get into all that, <laughs> what does the message of that empty tomb mean to you and I? The resurrection of the Lord it touches our lives in three very wonderful and specific spiritual areas. Romans 4, if you haven't already got there, sorry. Romans 4. And the issue of our justification and our sanctification and our glorification. He begins to touch in those areas. Romans 4, look at verse 25. Who was delivered for our offenses and was raised again for our justification. The resurrection of Christ, we, we come to, you're there in 4, and you're in Romans 4, right? Look back at chapter 3, verse 23. 323, for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. You're, you, you have this thing here about your sin. You come over to verse 25 of chapter 3, whom God has set forth to be a propitiation through faith in His blood. God the Father looks and says, hey, if you want to, that fully satisfying payment for your sin is in His blood. It's right there. Chapter 4, verse number 5, But to him that worketh not, but believeth on him that justifieth the ungodly, his faith is counted for righteousness. Chapter 5, verse 1, we're all in the same book. It's all right here. Therefore, being justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. All of that activity is based on 425, the fact that he was raised for our justification. The very fact, you know, you get a bill, 
You pay the bill off, and it says what? Paid in full. The resurrection does that for our justification. We are declared to have, we have been made His righteousness by the cross work. And you know what that includes? His resurrection. And it's right there. It touches our justification. Come over to chapter 6. The next one. (laughs) The next section. It touches our sanctification, our walk. Romans 6, verse, well, verse 3. Know ye not that so many of us as were baptized into Jesus Christ were baptized into His death? Therefore we are buried with Him by baptism into death, that like as Christ was raised up from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also should, watch that, walk in the newness of life. And again, the issue of baptism here is not water baptism. This is, this is the issue of identification. This is the issue of a, spiritual, a spirit baptism that we had at the moment of trusting Christ. It has nothing to do with water. It has to do with the fact that when you trusted Him and you placed your faith and faith alone in Him, that He instantly gave you His life and the newness of His life. And our job is to get in, study, figure it out, and go live in it. But notice what is happening here. We have this newness of life. Verse 5, For if we have been planted together in the likeness of His death, we shall be also in the likeness of His what? Resurrection. I'm in Romans 6 still. Romans 6, I hit the clicker too quick. I'm sorry. You get excited. This ought to excite you folks. Because the resurrection begins to touch it begins, to, it begins to move in and do. Somebody asked me one time, why do in the rapture do we have to be resurrected? Verse 5 tells you why. Because he was. We'll see his glorified body. Oh, but that thing's fantastic. You get excited about that. Drop down in verse number 11. Likewise reckon ye also yourselves to be dead indeed unto sin, but alive unto God through Jesus Christ our Lord. It begins to impact you. Come over real quick, Colossians chapter 2. It begins to, his resurrection is the basis of the newness of life. It's that likeness of his resurrection. Colossians 2 verse 6. Colossians 2 verse 6 and 7. As ye have therefore received Christ Jesus the Lord, so walk ye in Him. How did you receive Christ Jesus the Lord? By faith. We're saved by grace through faith. So walk ye in Him, rooted and built up in Him, and established in the faith as you have been taught, abounding therein with thanksgiving. You know what? My faith, I'm gonna, I'm, I, have, I trusted Him by faith. Now I'm going to walk by grace through faith. I'm going to go live my life. So his resurrection not only validates, says paid in full, it's a done deal, it's over, the account is closed. But then it also says here is how you're going to go live life and how you're going to live your life. And there's a newness about it. There's this identity in it that we then go and live. Now come back over to Philippians 3. Philippians chapter 3. Here's our future. Now, by the way, all of, these to- all of these three we could spend hours studying, especially the life now, the, the, our salvation of the present time right now. And we've done that, and we'll continue to do that. I just want you to see the impact of the resurrection. It has an impact into that. The very basis, the very foundation of everything we have and do is because of he rose again the third day. He is not here. The angels asked the ladies, why are you looking for the living among the dead? Oh, man, what a question. Woo. We, were, <laughs> we, were, we went to Garth Brooks last night, and 75,000 of our closest friends, and we had a great time. You know, I, I enjoy um, some of that. And about after an hour and a half of it, it's like, okay, we're done now, okay? <laughs> you know, especially when the drunk lady next to you falls down the stairs. You know, it's like, okay, help her up, you know? But the thing is, is I'm, I'm watching Garth. 
that man never stopped moving for the two hours that he was on the stage. Music is the international language of the world. But you know what? I was watching him and everything, and you just the pure excitement of doing what he did, the passion that he had. And I'm watching that, and I'm going, you know, we need to have the same about what we're doing. Now, he could sing his old songs, and all 75,000 of us are singing them, too. His new ones were like, what was the words? <laughs> we haven't heard that one yet. What's that? You know, but the old, and then, he, then he'd play, he, what was the name of that song at the end of the, that he sang? Uh, what's that? The Day the Music Died. So he's got this little thing he does, and they're holding up signs and everything. And this guy's, hey, sing this one. And he's like, yeah, come to a gar show to sing somebody else's music. But in the moment, he could sing, he sang that song perfectly by himself with the guitar. And I'm sitting there going, wow, if that man could do that in a godless world situation, what's our problem with what we have and what we're doing? It impacts everything we're about. And we had a good time. People watching is wonderful. Watching them do and set and do. And, and would I go again? Well, my wife would go, so I would go. Okay? But the thing of it is, is I look at that energy and I look at that passion. And he, again, he's just singing to the godless out there. And I look at that and I go, wow. We need to have that about this, about the resurrection of our Savior. Philippians 3, verse 20 and 21. Here's our glorification. Now, this gets you excited. So it gets me excited, okay? For our conversation is in heaven, from whence also we look for the Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. We're looking for that blessed hope and the glorious appearing of our great Savior, Jesus Christ, right? Titus 2, 3, 13 and 14. Who shall change our vile body that it might be fashioned like unto his glorious body? Now let's stop right there. In his resurrected body, we'll see it. He just walks through the wall and shows up in the middle of them. And he says, peace be unto you. They're scared to death. They're counting the room. There should only be 10, but there's 11. Where'd he come from? (laughs) Who let him in? He molecularly changes that physical, because he tells them, come and touch me and feel the prince. He cha- molecularly, that body changes, goes through the wall, and shows up in a physical, tangible, we can feel it, touch it. Woo. He looks over there. He looks at Mary Magdalene and says, you can't touch me. I haven't been to my father yet. He's got to finish out the high priest activity and stuff that he's going to be, that's going to happen in, out of Leviticus. And he goes and he says, you can't touch me. He comes back and less than three hours later, he looks at the ladies the, on the road there and they hug his feet and they can touch him. That body's moving, folks, to come from here to the third heaven and back in less than three hours. He's moving. Give him 50 minutes up. Half hour or so with the Lord and 50 minutes back. He's moving. In the twinkling of an eye, you're going to, you and I will have that kind of body. He sits down and says, you got something to eat? They go, yeah, we'll eat. Now, when we see the eating, it's a fellowship eating. It's not a substance eating. He doesn't have to eat for substance and life and energy. He's got it. He's just eating to have a fellowship time with them, a Lord's table with them, if you will. He's just enjoying their presence and being in their company. That's the body you and I get. Woo, man, moving. Take you some time to figure out which gears are going. Stop, and for some of us, slow down. (laughs) Boom, boom, you know. I think about, you know, we make the Jetsons look like kindergarten, you know. Wham, boom. That's what we get right there. That glorious body. His resurrected body. Now finish the verse. Verse 21, because as much as exciting as that is about getting a new body and being able to do some things, move from realm between realms and pop up and show up, and the rest of that verse is what is exciting. According to the word, according, he's going to give you this new body according to, there's a purpose in it. Not just so you can be the fastest guy on the track. (laughs) 
okay? According to the working whereby he is able even to subdue all things unto himself. He's going to use us to fill up that government of the heavenly places. And as his government increases, Isaiah 9, 6 says, and as it gets bigger and bigger, and as the, as the universe that we know in that new heaven and that new earth is expanded out, and those planets that are sitting out there that aren't inhabitable today because they're in a closed firmament for mankind. One day it'll be open. The sin curse will be gone. And you and I have the ability and the wonderful privilege of serving in that government for Him forever. And to be able to move and to do what is needed to be done to facilitate and to do and to work and to serve in His government. That's fantastic. It's all based on the resurrection. It's all based on that glorious body. Come over to Colossians 3. Finish them up there for you. Colossians 3. Colossians 3. And verse number 4. When Christ, who is our life, shall appear, then shall ye also appear with him in glory. Wow. No more sorrow, no more hurt, no more pain. All that is wonderful, but none of that compares to what we'll be doing out there. The hope of... The hope... Uh, can't quote the verse, it's right there. Which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. None of that will be compared to what we'll be up there doing. Come over to Galatians 6. Let's finish with here. Galatians 6. The many infallible proofs. This kind of gets your feet wet here a little bit this morning. Many is many. We're going to look at some of them, okay? Otherwise, we'll be here for years. But that's okay. Because when we go to glory, guess what we'll have? Eons and eons, ages and ages and ages. Right? Galatians 6, verse 14. I, I, this morning, I was up. We were out late, you know. I'm sitting there going, but my internal clock says, hey, dude, it's 5 o'clock, get up. I'm like, really, dude? You're going to go back one more hour. So I roll back over. 6 o'clock, I'm up this morning. And I'm thinking about today. And I'm thinking about this message. And the one, I'm like, you know, there's got to be a verse, a, just kind of a verse to just make us think about this. And to have this be our cry, Galatians 6, 14. And I thought about this verse. But God forbid that I should glory. This isn't about me. This isn't on me. It's not my activity. It's not my work. It's, it's his activity. It's how, why? Where, where do I glory? Save in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ, by whom the world is crucified unto me and I unto the world. Boy, you know where we need to be glorying? In that cross work of Christ. The death, the burial, and the resurrection. That's where our glory, that's where our, that's where our cry needs to be is right there. That's fantastic. To know, to be able to, to talk to someone and say, you know, you know what Easter, you know, it's not about bunnies and chocolate. Well, it could be with chocolate. But it's not about all, okay, you know. The chocolate bunnies, okay, we can do that. All right. But it's about what? Every day of our lives, folks. What's the message of that empty tomb? That's the question. You'll never find it in the world out there. You go to every religion out there, they have all these different kind of thoughts about the denying the doctrine of, of the resurrection and all this, or the swoon thing, the, the disciples, they took his body, the Roman leaders took his body, the Jewish leaders took your body. And you, think, and you read all that and you study it out and you go, really? I don't think so. When Paul... When Peter, in the early Acts period, he's called onto the carpet with the, by the Jewish leadership. You know what it was about? Not preaching Jesus of Nazareth, 
but it was preaching that Jesus of Nazareth rose from the dead. That's what got him. When the Jews come after Paul in Acts, they don't come after him for preaching that Jesus Christ was a great, you know, of Nazareth, but preaching Jesus Christ did what? Rose from the dead. And they nail him. And they go get him. Let's glory in the cross. Let's have the cross be our cry in everything that we do. Every, I mean, oh, yeah, whether you go to a concert or a ball game, whether you just sit out back enjoying a cup of tea and or co- tea or coffee and enjoying the, the view. Whatever you do in word or deed, do all. Man, glory in the cross. Have that be our mindset. Have that be our focus. You follow that? Look at the proofs, the many infallible proofs, okay? All right. Dearly Father, we thank you for the morning, Lord. We thank you for your word. And we thank you for the activity and what you accomplished at Calvary for our sins, for all of us. And we'll give you the praise and the glory. In your name we pray, amen. All right, we're going to...